The Arizona Coyotes hit a significant roadblock in their quest to become a hockey team again. Plus, we're exploring the state of sports media with Roku's head of sports. It's Monday, June 24th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The Arizona Coyotes are facing major challenges in their attempt to restart the franchise. Joining me now to discuss is front office sports senior reporter AJ Perez. Welcome, AJ. Yeah, thanks for having me back on. Great to have you as always. So the Coyotes were sold to a group led by Ryan Smith, who re- relocated the team to Salt Lake City. But the outgoing ownership group was granted the right to restart the franchise if they can build an arena within a certain time frame. To do that, they'd zeroed in on a parcel of land north of Phoenix that the state was putting up for auction. That auction was supposed to happen Thursday, but the Arizona Land Department just canceled it. So what yeah. happened there? Yeah, this is actually the second time they've gone after this piece of land. Because right after last May, May 2023, they lost the referendums in Tempe that would have built a, a an entertainment district and a brand new, uh, you know, hockey arena there. Um, you know, that that kind of fell apart. So like pretty much a couple, few weeks later, they zeroed in on this land. First, it was 200 acres. They got the... S, like the estimate of how much it would cost to uh, for the infrastructure bill for that land. And there's way too much for uh, Alex Marilla, who's the owner of the, of, of the Coyotes. So they kind of went back to the drawing board earlier this year, focusing on about 110 acres, uh, cut down that plot. And uh, yeah, on, on this coming Thursday, it was supposed to be this land auction. And I talked to the Coyotes, uh, a representative from them, an hour before it was canceled. They had no idea it was wow. coming. Nobody saw it coming. And and then they put out this really terse statement, um, which which was which was something else. It was like it wasn't met very well locally, and uh, especially for an owner during the four years he's had the team before he sold it, you know, didn't make a lot of friends in the valley. Right. The Arizona Land Department says you're going to need a special permit for this land, uh, and so we're we're canceling the whole auction because you know you you might have won it, and we have no guarantee that you're actually going to be able to build there. The Coyotes come back with a statement that it wasn't like, uh, you know, keep these bridges built here. It was, it was basically, it was, they're angry and they're not afraid to show it. And they said, you know, if they're going to cost the, you know, the state all this money that there was going to go to good stuff. Um, and, you know, maybe that's a, good, a negotiating tactic, but it makes me wonder sort of where, what's the status of their ability to, to build in Arizona now? And it wasn't just locally, the politicians I've talked to, the, you know, the hockey fans I talked to locally, but even around the NHL, there were, this was, I wouldn't say this was a toss in this whole five year thing, uh, for an expansion team that for the Cowboys to relaunch, um, you know, within five years. But even if you won, even if the, if the auction went forward Thursday as planned and, you know, it was $68.5 million was the, uh, was the appraised value. That's like the basement price to start. Yeah. It could have went for double, maybe even more. It, it, the very few of the long like these, these 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 land auctions go for triple, but it could have been at least double. So we were talking about one hundred and twenty something million dollars, um, and uh, that's uh, you know that that's not insignificant. And then you have to you have to work with the city. Yeah, this wasn't zoned properly. This was not, in, <laughs> and this was you know something they could have looked into many many like a year ago. They could have yeah. seen. I'm like zoning. Do we do we have the proper zoning? you know, permits to go forward with this. It's just because just because you buy a piece of land, that's one part of it. You have to get the necessary permits from from Phoenix and whatever local local government you need to go forward. And we saw this with the with the with the vote in Tempe last year. It, it's like it's Alex Merlo and others of the organization just don't didn't really put in like the, the footwork, the groundwork to get you know to get the locals on board. To get to when when you when you talk about the tax incentive, the tax base and uh, how much taxes are going to be going to Phoenix and Arizona, like they did in that statement. Well, first you have to, you know, you have to get there. And this has been a problem since Alex Murillo bought the team. This is why they left Glendale. Alex Murillo could have, could have renegotiated that. Instead, he said, oh, we're not doing that. We're going to Mullet Arena, 5,000 seat arena at, at, on the ASU campus. It, I was there for the first game. It was great. It's not sustainable. And there was, they, they played two seasons there. There weren't, you know, for a third season, four season and a fifth season, they had to have solidified plans and they still don't. And now it's, you know, it's a, there, there were doubts already. There's more doubts now that there, that, that Alex Murrell was the guy to bring back hockey in the Arizona um, you know, market. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a big market, you know, whether or not you feel like it's a hockey market and one that, you know, at, at a certain point, um, there's been enough problems with this ownership group, with this, with this franchise 
that you start to look to the people running that franchise. Um, just gut feeling um, is, are, are they going to be able to, is, is hockey going to start at some point in Phoenix under Alex Murillo at, at any point? Or if it happens, do you think it's going to be under a different group? It seems less likely. I think he can sell 49% of it. Uh, you know, he can't offload this five-year window is his. He can't really offload that to anybody else. He, he can sell 49% of the future of the team, of the Cowboys organization, but you're, he's still going to be the front man. He'll still be the, bright, the, you know, the primary owner. And I just don't think that from what you know, everything that's gone down since he, since he purchased the team, I just don't see it. You know, things could change. But I think it's pretty much you're going to have to wait five or a little less than five years now because it is a great market. The fans have been there have been through so much. And, you know, it's and it's, you know, that the league ran it for a short time many years ago. There's been many just owner after owner in that these these fans just have not been, you know, served a good hockey team, a, a stable hockey team for so many years that it's probably maybe it's best that somebody else takes charge. And maybe they play a footprint arena at the start, maybe in five plus years. You know, that's arena. It's, it's kind of like what Utah is going to be next year. A lot of, a lot of, you know, 10 to 12,000 12, seats are the, you, where you can see the ice perfectly without any obstructions. You know, that's what footprint would be again, because that's where the team was many, many, many years ago. Um, it's just so it's, you know, it's going to do that. It's going to take some, some, some time, maybe working with the Suns, which, the Cowboys really have never done, uh, you know, just to kind of, you know, work with them, work with the, the, you know, the, the owners there to, you know, for, uh, towards, it'd be, it'd be for a few years at footprint and then working somewhere else in downtown Phoenix or elsewhere in Phoenix, that makes the sense, you know, it just building a third major arena is tough in, in that market. You got Glendale, you got footprint. And now this, this, uh, kind of, now it's kind of more of a pipe dream arena in North Phoenix. Yeah. Yeah, we shall see. A.J. Perez, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me. It's not news to anyone that we are undergoing a transition in media, and some companies are better positioned than others. One of the more interesting players in this space is Roku, which is trying to be the platform on which these streaming wars play out, so that however things shake out, they'll still be there. At the same time, they're also buying up sports rights to bolster what they can offer to all of their customers. I spoke to Roku's head of sports, Joe Franzetta, on how he sees the future of sports and media consumption, and that conversation is coming up next. I'm joined now by Roku's head of sports, Joe Franzetta. Welcome, Joe. Hey, hey Owen. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on. So first, let's do some quick orientation around what we mean when we say Roku, because Roku sells a box that gives a, a TV smart TV capabilities. I think that's probably the first way people understood what Roku was, but you also have a subscription service that bundles together a bunch of channels. And you also have your own rights to sports events that Roku, I think, itself broadcasts. So if you could just give us a quick tour of the Roku-verse, that would be helpful. Sure, sure. So as you said, so Roku is a uh, connected television platform uh, operating system in over 80 million uh, active accounts, or what we call streaming households. We've got uh, a collection of all uh, partners, all kinds of distribution uh, of uh, existing uh, content that you might think of when you turn on a Roku device and you see apps from various partners. We also have our Roku channel, which is our owned and operated service, which has 80,000 VOD titles, hundreds of uh, fast channels, fast ad supported television channels, uh, Roku originals content. And as you note, um, starting to look at some live sports content. So uh, we've got a uh, wide array of uh, sports content that we're able to aggregate into uh, a platform, into a destination that allows people to consume sports from all across the uh, uh, universe of sports content distributors. And so you're still primarily a platform, but you are starting to gather your own sports rights um, what what was, went into that decision to uh, start to straddle that line between content and platform? So I'd go back first to our initial thoughts on uh, sports and how we can play a role in sports as sports moves uh, to streaming. So all sports are on Roku effectively somewhere. And the challenge has been with fragmentation and disaggregation of rights, the ability for viewers to find the sports they want to watch had, you know, becoming more and more challenging. So given that we have a broad platform and given that 
uh, all sports content through all of these sport these partnerships that are on our platform exist on the platform somewhere. We set out to create a aggregated destination, so a one stop shop really for all things sports. And that's whether you want to watch an NFL game on Prime or you want to watch it on Paramount or wherever it might be. We aggregate that into one destination uh, that a viewer can find all the sports that they're uh, interested in viewing. In addition to that, because we have the Roku channel and we have the opportunity to provide programming on a free ad supported basis to viewers, whether it's Roku Originals content. So we've done some uh, sports based Roku Originals. For instance, we just launched something this past weekend uh, with UFC called Fight Inc. Uh, it's a three part documentary series about inside the business of the UFC. We uh, dipped our toes in the water with live programming with the Rich Eisen show uh, a couple of years ago. Rich has been a uh, tremendous partner providing us uh, daily sports talk from uh, uh, three hours a day, five days a week. And <clears throat> we put Rich on his own 24-7 uh, channel. That 24-7 channel, other 24-7 fast channels that are contained within the Roku channel uh, environment, whether they're from the NFL or NBA, uh, which we have an exclusive with, MLB, et cetera, all of those are integrated into our larger sports experience. So as we start looking at that larger sports experience, we began thinking about ways to layer in experiences for both viewers and the sponsorship partners that we have that want to reach those viewers that are free and ad supported. So our view on something like uh, MLB Sunday lead off the package we got with MLB uh, was that we are able to integrate something into a larger aggregated experience. So not only do we have the Sunday games from MLB, but we've aggregated all of their partners live games into a common destination. We have clips and highlights from every single game. We have VOD content, long form VOD content. We have a new MLB fast channel. So if you're an MLB fan, you want a one-stop shop to find all things sports. I'm sorry, all things MLB. And we've created that destination. And into that, we've layered some live rights that we think uh, are beneficial and complementary to that overall experience to drive attention, to pull people in, and to create uh, awareness of what we're doing and to create opportunities for our sponsorship partners. Right. I mean, I think there is this, this sort of issue for the sports fan these days where um, you want to watch sports, but it, it's in 10 different places. Um, and so, yeah, you're solving for that. A couple other platforms are, are also seeking to do the same thing. Um, it does sometimes lead to a sort of a next step problem, which is like, okay, here, here's the game I want. And then you have, you click on it and you wait to see like, am I actually subscribed to that thing? Cause I don't know actually which service it's on. I just know I can see it on, you know, my Roku, whatever, whatever service I'm using. And so I, I'm wondering how much of a pain point you're seeing there where you know, like, okay, I click on the thing, like, oh, it's on Paramount. I don't have Paramount. Like, okay, I'll just go watch something else. I feel like um, the, there can be that, like, it's still the same issue. It's just sort of one step removed. H have you found that? Well, I think what we found is that it was very clear that people were frustrated by the uh, uh, inability to, to easily find the content that they want to watch, in many cases, on platforms that they already have access to. Mm -hmm. Um, so creating the aggregation capabilities in that destination removes that layer of friction and I think makes for an overall better viewing experience. Now, if somebody wants to watch something and they learn that what they, where they want to watch it happens to be behind, um, a subscription service that they don't have, we're able to then easily facilitate them, uh, be, you know, attaining, obtaining that subscription. Sure. So I think. At the end of the day, there's still going to be some subscription services out there that are going to be presenting the sports content you want to watch. You want to make the pathway to it as frictionless as possible. And we found a lot of both of our internal research and sort of the data that we're seeing uh, really sort of proves out the point that that is, in fact, effective and something that's desired. Yeah. And so you, you mentioned that um, the MLB Sunday morning games, you've got those, you know, Peacock used to have them. Now they're sort of more broadly accessible through you. Um, uh, you also have Formula E um, and maybe a couple other things, you know, and you've got your sort of your hub channels for NFL, NBA, MLB. Um, yeah. Going for the things that you are getting rights for that Roku, you know, like like you have the, the rights for those. Um, how do you identify a sports property that um, like, are you trying to drive subscriptions or are you just trying to make it 
a sort of more seamless experience or sort of a little bit of everything? How, how do you say this is worth it for us? I, I think it's all of the above, really. I, I mean, at the end of the day, we're creating a an experience that aggregates all of the sports content that's on our platform, whether it's a subscription-based service or it is a fast channel with free you know, access to sports content or it is uh, a Roku original that we have uh, created and developed and are providing to users for free, or if it's rights that we've acquired on an ad supported basis, we're integrating all of that into one experience with the idea that, you know, I know it's cliche, but rising tide lifts all boats, right? So to the extent that we're building an aggregated destination that viewers are repeating, repeatedly coming back to, they're always going to find some content that they want to watch, whether we're helping partners drive subscriptions, we're helping partners drive engagement with existing subscriptions, we're creating uh, opportunities for people to watch content they want to watch for free on an ad supported basis. The idea is that we're providing something to everyone. And in a streaming universe with more and more sports content moving into streaming, the idea that we can provide that one stop shop, we think is incredibly valuable to viewers to leagues, to distribution partners, to sponsors, to everybody in the ecosystem. I want to zoom out a bit to just to this moment we're at in in media and, and how people watch yeah. things these days, because obviously cable is on its way out or on its way to a much smaller version of what it is, but, um, but it's still a big piece of the puzzle. Sure. Um, streaming is obviously on the rise, but for most services, still not profitable. And then we have sports that is, you know, I've said this many times before here, but you know, basically the one way left that you can get a lot of people to watch the same thing at the same time at a, yep. you know, in a time-based way. Um, how do you see um, sports as kind of, um, well, well, part of the, the media, media ecosystem, you know, in this, in this moment we're in, uh, sure. but also like as part of like Roku's overall strategy? Sure. So great questions. I mean, obviously you hit the nail on the head, like sports is, and continues to be, always has been, and always will be uh, the one reliable piece of or type of content that you can aggregate an audience around, and that makes it incredibly valuable to a number of different uh, people in the ecosystem for a number of different reasons. Uh, you know, we like to say that uh, all television will be streamed, and therefore we believe that all sports will be streamed. But as you say, you know, as things exist today. Uh, cable still important. It's still part of the ecosystem. And our goal and objective is to, uh, as things migrate and as things evolve, to continue to build those experiences and to build that capability set around what sports drives. So sports drives interest in not only viewership, but affinity and sort of people want, it's tribal. People have, you know, want, want to follow specific teams and specific leagues. So we want to continue to drive personalization capabilities. We want to continue to drive uh, additional opportunities for people to engage, whether it's ultimately sports betting or merchandise sales or ticketing or other things that are sort of, you know, traditionally outside of the television ecosystem. We want to bring those into the television ecosystem and then sort of writ large across all of the uh, different players in, in the sports universe. To your point, sports generates large audiences, so it's going to continue to be valuable for a number of di different constituents, and you're going to continue to see evolution in the way uh, that sports is packaged and the way it's presented. And we feel that we are uh, in the position that we're in somewhat uniquely situated to be an aggregation destination for all of those things as they continue to evolve. Yeah. And you said, you know, we're moving toward everything being streamed. When do you think that's going to happen? And, you know, like, let's say when we get to the, like 90% plus of like everything's on streaming. I honestly have no real good idea around that. I think it's, you know, there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time and energy trying to find what, if there's a floor on cable and if so, what that floor is. I, I can't really prognosticate about something like that, but what I can say is we're seeing, and I'm sure you're seeing a significant transition into the streaming world and sports is becoming a big part of that. I think entertainment sort of led the way and sports is now more aggressively moving into streaming when how that makes sort of a fuller transition i can't speak to but i can say that we are preparing for it and we are presenting viewership opportunities and experience opportunities that i think are optimized for the streaming environment so we're excited about the future and and where it's headed and and are ready for all things that come 
And when we look at the you know, the media rights contracts, especially for the the major league, like you know the NFL is now bringing in something like ten billion dollars a year on its media contracts. Your know, NBA is you know not going to quite get there, but it's it's going to be pretty enormous. Um, uh, for do do you feel like the media networks in on some level have to overpay for sports because uh, and just in terms of you know the amount of revenue they bring in in terms of ad dollars or subscribers. Um, they have to pay above that because there's only one NBA. There's only, you know, if you want people to subscribe because they want the NBA, also because uh, you, you want all those eyeballs in the same place at the same time, you pay a premium versus something like, I don't know, uh, you know, a TV show that you want to pick up because it's going to get X number of, of eyeballs. Do you, you, you see what I'm saying here? Do you, do you think that's, I've just been wondering this myself, if that's something like where, <laughs> part of what's driving these media rights values to go up and up. Yeah, it's I mean it's a good question. Obviously I I can't speak for how other people value uh sports rights relative to other content that they may be looking at. Obviously, you know, you read the news, you 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 see the uh rumors about how much things are going to go for, you you understand how things have been, you know, sold and packaged in the past. Obviously, sports rights continue to be extremely valuable. How people value those and what sort of direct monetization versus halo effect versus existential uh, rationales that people use for what they're willing to pay. But I would never say something's overpriced because I believe in the market and the idea that, you know, things, things fetch the price that they're, uh, that people are willing to pay for them. Um, and as a result, you know, I, I I'm obviously biased towards sports. I'm in the sports industry. I think it's incredibly valuable. And I think that it drives all kinds of engagement. Uh, it is, as you mentioned earlier, the, you know, one of the last types of content that could, you know, reliably draw a big audience and drawing a big audience is important for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. I can't speak to everybody's reasons, um, but I can say that, you know, at Roku, we firmly believe in the sports business and are very excited about, you know, continuing to uh, um, build upon our leadership position as an aggregation destination for sports. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And does it, you, you used the word existential, you know, a moment ago, and it sort of made me think about how um, we uh, we're still maybe in this phase of like we're not sure if all these streaming services are going to survive or at least survive in their current form. Um, you know, some might merge. There's been talk, say, like a Paramount Peacock merger. Um, you know, everyone's trying to find kind of the right size to be, and you know, probably is just trying to be as big as possible. Um, I, I'm sort of curious about your position as an aggregator of all this, do you feel kind of like you're you're a step removed from the streaming wars because it's sort of like any of these companies can win or lose, and and you'll still be kind of, you know, one step back being the aggregator of whoever's still there. Yeah, I think that's a good observation. I wouldn't necessarily say that we're one step back. I think we're right there, arm in arm with all of our partners, um, and and of course, you know, nobody has a crystal ball to understand what the future looks like with consolidation, with mergers and acquisition, with whatever the, whatever the future may hold. But I think, you know, as um, our president of Roku Media has said in the past, we are not really in the streaming wars as much as the streaming wars are being fought on our platform. Um, and it's not even that they're necessarily being fought on our platform, is they're just sort of unfolding on our platform. Um, and to your point, aggregation and being a lead in to uh, television content that is that is contained across all these various um, uh, distribution points is in fact our uh, um, special sauce or our position in the industry is that ability to be the front door to be the lead into all of these various content opportunities. And so, if even if you're not you know like fighting in the streaming wars exactly. I'm wondering if you feel like you are to some degree in the platform wars because, you know, there's you guys, and I understand these are somewhat different products, but there's Roku, there's YouTube TV, there's Apple TV is, you know, offers something kind of along the same lines, um, others as well. Um, I'm, so yeah, I, how, how fierce are the platform wars? Well, I mean, first of all, the partners that you just mentioned are active participants on our platform. So Apple TV's, uh, you know, Apple TV's app is on our platform. YouTube, YouTube TV is on our platform. And so, you know, we feel that there's a tremendous opportunity to both present the content that those partners have aggregated, 
uh, to make that content readily available across our platform, and then to supplement that content with content that we may have a more direct uh, interest in. So I wouldn't necessarily position it as something where we're in direct competition with these partners. I think it's more an opportunity where we can cooperate, we can help build their businesses while we're helping build our business. Um, and, you know, I think if we just keep our minds focused on that fact and the fact that we have a tremendous position as a leader and, you know, in, in the platform side of the business that will continue to succeed with that. All right. Very interesting stuff. Joe Franzetta, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me, Owen. Really great. Appreciate your time. That's it for today. Subscribe wherever you like to listen and throw us a like if you're on YouTube. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.